In this video, I'm going to look at vasodilator and antianginal pharmacology. These drugs are used clinically for hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias, as well as being used for both the short and long-term management of angina pectoris. Drugs in this class fall into either one of three broad categories. We can have the calcium ion channel blockers, or CCBs. There are also a group called the nitrites and organic nitrates. And finally, we can have the beta adrenoceptor antagonists, and I spoke about these in a previous video. An example of a CCB could be philodipine. An example of a nitrate is glycerol trinitrate. An example of a beta blocker is propanolol. So as we know from physiology, calcium plays an important role in facilitating muscle contraction, as well as being used in the generation and propagation of nerve impulses. To get into the cells where it exerts its physiological effect, calcium has to pass through special transmembrane proteins called ion channels, and this is because it is a charged molecule. These channels open up under certain physiological conditions and allow an influx of calcium in towards the cell. For smooth muscle and cardiac tissue, this channel is called an L-type calcium ion channel and is distinct from the other types of calcium channel in skeletal muscle, for example. Vasodilator and antianginal drugs chiefly affect this L-type calcium ion channel in both visceral smooth muscle and cardiac tissue. They block the influx of calcium in towards the cell and therefore reduce or sometimes even prevent a variety of different physiological effects. In the heart, this includes reducing the force of contraction of the myocardium and a slowing of the generation and propagation of nerve impulses. In peripheral arteries and veins, however, this leads to vasodilation. Let's move on to the first class of drugs I want to take a look at, the calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are used clinically in the treatment of hypertension and angina pectoris and can be broken down based on their chemical makeup or by their specificity to either cardiac or vascular smooth muscle. We can break them up into the dihydropyridine drugs and these are all easily distinguishable by looking at the end of their name as they all end in the suffix peen. So for example, amlodipine, nifedipine, felodipine, and so on and so forth. These are generally vascular specific, blocking the L-type calcium ion channels in peripheral arteries alone. For this reason, this class tends to be used as antihypertensive agents most. We then have our non-dihydropyridine drugs, and these tend to be more cardioselective. Breaking this class down a bit, we have the phenylalkylamines, and really there is only one drug in this class that is used in any way clinically, and this is verapamil. Verapamil is mostly specific to the L-type calcium channels on the myocardium, and conduction system of the heart, and is chiefly used in the treatment of stable angina pectoris. Lastly, we have the benzothiazepines, which again has only one clinically relevant drug, which is diltiazem. Diltiazem really sits in between the other two classes of calcium channel blocker and is basically equally specific to the L-type calcium channels on both heart and vascular smooth muscle. It therefore can be used both as an antihypertensive and an antianginal drug. All of these drugs share common pharmacodynamics. They all prevent or reduce the influx of calcium into muscle cells from the extracellular space and therefore present the excitation-contraction coupling that leads to muscle contraction. I want to now have a look at an example of each calcium channel blocker class I've mentioned above. As mentioned previously, the calcium channel blocking agents differ by chemical structure, but they also differ in their selectivity in affecting cardiac or smooth muscle L-type calcium ion channels. The dihydropyridine drugs, an example of this which could be amlodipine, are specific to vascular smooth muscle. Let's bring up a sketch of an artery to show how amlodipine acts to bring about its pharmacologic effect. So here, in brown, is the tunica media, the layer containing smooth muscle cells. On the surface of these cells, in pink here, we have the L-type calcium ion channels that span the cell membrane and allow influx of calcium into the cell when required. In terms of pharmacodynamics, amlodipine is lipid soluble and binds to the portion of the L-type ion channels that I've marked in blue here. This basically causes it to change its shape. This conformational change reduces the amount of calcium ions that can enter the cell 
and therefore stop smooth muscle contraction. The overall effect of this in peripheral arteries is to cause vasodilation, a decrease in total peripheral resistance, and therefore tend to lower blood pressure. This is what makes the dihydropyridine drugs, like amlodipine, so good as antihypertensives, as they really are specific to peripheral arteries. And that's really it. Dihydropyridine drugs can also be used to treat angina. The efficacy of these drugs is poor compared with other classes, and this is really due to the pharmacodynamics being a little bit convoluted. So let's work through it. A decrease in blood pressure will reduce the stress of the walls of the ventricles, and this is through reduction of blood volume and ventricular filling pressure. This then lowers the amount of work the heart muscle cells have to do to pump the blood around the body. As the heart muscle doesn't have to work so hard, the demand for oxygen is greatly reduced, and therefore the ischemia pain that results from anaerobic respiration can't occur. Therefore, this reduces the symptoms of angina. As these drugs have no effect on the conduction system of the heart, a decrease in blood pressure tends to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and this is through the baroreceptor reflex. This, therefore, tends to lead to a reflex tachycardia, which then brings up all the angina symptoms that we were trying to stop again. So this is where our non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers are better in the treatment of angina. For example, verapamil is relatively more selective for the L-type ion channels in the heart. I will mention, though, as this always tends to be the case with drug prescription, that at higher doses, the ion channels in smooth muscle are also frequently stimulated. In the heart, verapamil causes a negative ionotropic effect, reducing the amount of calcium able to enter cardiac myocytes, and therefore reducing the force of contraction of the heart muscle. This then leads to less oxygen demand, and therefore tends to produce less reflex tachycardia, as the sympathetic nervous system is unable to exert its effect. It doesn't matter how much of the beta adrenal receptors are stimulated, if calcium can't get into the cell anyway, then the sinoatrial node isn't going to be able to depolarise, and the heart rate isn't going to speed up, which then causes the tachycardia, which, which would then lead to the angina symptoms. Dilatiazem sits somewhere in between the other two classes I've mentioned, being a partial antagonist for vascular smooth muscle, and a partial antagonist for the ion channels present in the heart. Having both cardio-inhibitive and vasodilator properties reduces the risk of reflex tachycardia further and therefore helps prevent angina symptoms whilst also concurrently lowering blood pressure. What we can say in general though is that the cardio-selective drugs are better suited to the treatment of angina and the vascular-selective drugs are really better in the treatment of hypertension. The adverse effects of calcium channel blockers are usually related to too much of the desired effect coming about, in addition to occurring secondary to the physiological mechanism that the body sets up in order to counteract the drug. So this will include our reflex tachycardias. Dose-dependent adverse drug reactions of the calcium channel blockers include bradycardia due to excessive slowing of the heart rate, hypotension due to excessive vasodilation in the periphery, peripheral flushing due to a reactive hyperemia settling into this vasodilation, and peripheral edema. Other more bizarre responses include a gingival hyperplasia, or general gum thickening, and this is with the use of amlodipine in particular. The reason for this is unknown at this time. I will now talk briefly about organic nitrates and their use in the treatment of angina pectoris. Examples of organic nitrate drugs include glycerol trinitrate, and isosorbide mononitrate. In terms of pharmacodynamics, nitrate drugs increase the production of nitric oxide, or NO, which is a potent peripheral vasodilator. The exact mechanism for this is somewhat uncertain, and perhaps occurs through the interaction of the drug with certain thiol compounds when in the bloodstream. The production of nitric oxide by a nitrate leads to vasodilation of smooth muscle, but this predominantly occurs in veins, with little or no effect on, on arterial smooth muscle. As nitric oxide is lipid soluble, it can directly pass through the cell membrane of smooth muscle cells to promote its pharmacological effects. Nitric oxide inhibits various intracellular enzymes that then promote smooth muscle contraction. Therefore, its mode of action is relatively independent of the calcium ion channel and works essentially by preventing all the muscle proteins from being in a state ready to contract. 
The effect of the drug is that by increasing the size of the lumen of peripheral veins, the pressure or preload of the heart is then reduced and prevents the heart from having to contract as forcefully. Nitrates don't however have any direct effects on myocardial activity and therefore the reflex tachycardia is again a problem. However, the dose that is usually given is sufficient to stave off any significant effects, and in terms of pharmacokinetics, nitrate drugs tend to have a very short half-life, being rapidly inactivated by the liver. It is therefore important that the preparation and route of administration is given adequate consideration in order to allow the desired effects to occur. Nitrates are typically prepared as a buccal spray or sublingual tablet, allowing rapid absorption due to the high vascularity of these areas. This allows the drug to get to where it needs to go fast and avoid inactivation before it's even brought about its physiological effect. Other long-term preparations can be used, such as sustained release capsules or a transdermal patch, but tend to be ineffective long-term due to the idea of becoming tolerant to the effects of the drug with a repeated administration. There is no concrete evidence to explain why this occurs and it is an ongoing area of research. Drug tolerance of nitrates make the overall pharmacologic management of angina perhaps more challenging than the pathologies I've mentioned previously. So just how would a clinician go about treating angina pharmacologically? Well, in terms of long-term control of angina symptoms, prescription of a cardioselective non-dihydropyridine CCB, such as diltiazem, is usually initially considered. Combination therapy, with using both a calcium channel blocker and beta blocker, as this has additional sympatholytic ability, can be more efficacious, but does include taking two drugs instead of one, and has been shown, in rare cases, to cause congestive heart failure, especially when amlodipine is mixed with a beta blocker. Efficacy studies have shown beta blockers to be more useful in reducing the occurrence of angina attacks than with a CCB in isolation, and also they, they can potentially lower future risk of myocardial infarction. However, the side effect profile tends to be worse with beta blockers and little difference in overall rates of cardiac death have been concluded in the research undertaken to study this. For short-term relief of ischemic pain that is predictable and typically exercise-induced, a highly bioavailable preparation of a nitrate compound is recommended, so a buccal or sublingual spray. Transdermal or oral preparations are also available options, but given the issues surrounding tolerance which I highlighted earlier, the long-term efficacy of these preparations is mixed, and really it's recommended that nitrate drugs shouldn't be used alone when pharmacologically managing angina, if at all possible. I'll take a look at the overall efficacy of CCBs in the management of hypertension in a later video. This video has been a basic introduction to vasodilator and anti-anginal pharmacology. This group of drugs are used in the management of hypertension, cardiac arrhythmias and stable angina and includes calcium channel blockers, organic nitrate drugs and beta adrenoceptor antagonists. In general, we can say that the mode of action or pharmacodynamics of this group is to stop calcium from being transported inside smooth muscle and cardiac tissue by the blocking of L-type calcium ion channels. This reduces vasodilation of peripheral vasculature and reduces the force and rate of contraction of the heart. The overall effect of this is to decrease blood pressure by a fall in peripheral resistance and therefore reduce the work the heart needs to do to pump blood effectively around the body. The treatment of angina requires both long-term control and immediate relief of symptoms and requires coordination through a combination of the drugs belonging to this class, as well as scrupulous choice of agents so to not exacerbate ischemic pain. In the next video, I'm going to introduce the drugs affecting the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, looking at the various different agents and their clinical use in managing hypertension.